You know what's cool about a spike buck? They're almost everywhere. Doesn't matter how great your habitat, how big of a quote big buck area it is, everyone sees spike bucks. Some are tall, some are short. And it's something that when you grow up, you know, I want to I want to get us back to this point, but I think there's some things you can learn from a spike buck. And I want to talk about those and uh, some as it relates to hunting strategy and deer hunting strategy and scouting. But at the same time, think back to your kid. You know, most of us, I think if we're brought up right. You look at it like in, in the hunting world, I wasn't brought up in the hunting world. You know, no one in my family hunted, but if you're brought up right, you're gonna look at a spike buck and, and you're excited. And you look at that and you see that buck in the woods, it's a buck, you know, you're, you're super excited. Um, I go to Pennsylvania and I've been to Pennsylvania, this will be my 21st gun season coming up for the gun season opener out on public land. And the cabin I was at for many years, um, they shot about 170 some bucks at some point. I think that was through let's say their 34th year, 35th year. And out of all those, I would say well over half were spikes, maybe little three pointers or something, maybe had a little fork started. Think of all the excitement that that brought to all those hunters that averaged 17 guys in camp at times, 17 hunters or some women at times. But there were many, many buckshot. A lot of those were spikes and a lot of excitement. Now, I'm not saying that that's good management practice. What I'm saying is that's a lot of fun. And I think we need to get back to that. You know, one of the things people talk about, well, they shoot a spike buck because they want to eat some food. You can't eat the antlers. And there are areas, and I've seen this in the UP of Michigan, for example, where you don't have doe permits. And so because the deer population is so low, in fact, if you want a sustainable population, you want those older does in the herd. So there are areas like that. People say they want the meat, so you can't shoot a doe. You'd always, you're always better off shooting a, a big old doe if it's not a matter of population uh, control or that there's not enough deer. Does are always better. You get way more meat. And if you really like me, you know, people say, well, you can't eat the antler, so they'll shoot a spike. And that's kind of a silly, really dumb thing to say when you can shoot a doe. And does are very easy to kill, too. They're, they're, they do the same thing every day. They have a small home range. So why not shoot a, a doe where you can get twice as much meat than a little year and a half old spike? And, and that kind of brings up the next point. It could be a giant. So people shoot a spike and say, well, it's a big old spike. Seems like a lot of people say, well, it was a big old four point. That was a big four point. There's never going to be anything else wrong. 99.9% .9 of the time, it was going to be something else. You just shot it was when it was a baby, when it was young, and it didn't have a chance to develop. And so that's, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, that uh, you, you shot that if it's legal, you want to eat, makes you excited, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But don't ever fool yourself into thinking that, that buck's never going to be something. You know, people tell me that, and they're people that you know don't monitor the herd much. You know, they're you know they're people that they don't really know exactly what's going on out there. It might, yeah, it's a spike. It looks like a spike from last year. They kind of look alike. You know, they're they got two little things going up like this, and and that one looks like the two little things going up the next year like that, and that looks like the one ten years ago like that. That doesn't mean it's freaking ten years old. You know, when you look at them like that, that doesn't mean that. Jeff's fired up, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Just for that point. <laughs> but um, there's many stories and many uh, instances of captive whitetails that were spikes that turned out to be 180 inch plus. And so it can happen even in the UP of Michigan. I, I think they, they talked about a no spike rule up there would protect 50% of all year and a half old bucks. Meaning it would save half of them. Because they don't really grow that much. In fact, up there, three points on a side would protect 82% uh, of the bucks. So that's a high percentage that only have, you know, that are only spikes or four points, three points or less. The bottom line is though, they can grow up into be something really giant. In a lot of areas, you just don't know because it's just the average buck. So to say it's inferior, you're saying the average buck's inferior when 50% are spikes to begin with. Trying to find his way. There's something interesting about a year and a half old buck. If they're in really heavy winter areas, then a lot of times, and they need to know the way to find winter cover, the deer yards up north, they need to find that. It's not instinctual. They just don't know, hey, I need to point my head that way and walk. They don't know that. They have to follow the herd and they have to go with and they have to be guided. And a lot of times that guidance comes from their mother. And so 
if the mother's not around, they're not guided to those deer yards, they, they die. They hang out in their, their fall range, their summer range, and gets three feet of snow on the ground, and they can't move, and they're susceptible to predation, starvation. And so they need to find those deer yards. And so that's when you see those deer that are in wilderness areas that need to move miles to find winter cover, then a lot of times they don't disperse until they're a year and a half old, which is a yearling buck, which means that's the first set of antlers at that time. Big ag-rich farmland area where there's a lot of deer, a lot of times those, those bucks will disperse as a fawn, as a buck fawn. So you see this little buck fawn walking around. And again, they're just trying to find their way. They don't know where to go. And when you think about it, they just gotten kicked out by female social pressure. It doesn't matter if they're a fawn or a year and a half old. That's why you see them wandering around by themselves sometimes. They just got kicked out from their mothers. The last place they want to find is an area dominated by female social pressure, which is why I'm so big at not creating doe factories during the summer where you put tons of food, thick cover, you attract all the fawning for the area because you have beans, clover, in large supply out on your land, and all of a sudden you have a lot of does and fawns. Well, why does a buck want to stay there? When he's young, he was kicked out by female social pressure. He wants to find his own way, and that's where you have opportunity. You have opportunity because you can embrace and keep them. He's trying to find his way. You want food sources, many food sources. You want outside corners of food sources, long linear plots that are on different sides of elevation changes, multiple food plots, little hunting plots mixed in, because those are the areas that he'll find his little honey hole and he'll just stay by himself. All of a sudden, a couple friends come over from a mile away this way, mile and that, the average dispersal rate is a mile and a half. So all of a sudden you start collecting year and a half old bucks on your land because you have multiple habitats you have multiple food sources. They're not dominated by female social pressure. And guess what? It gives you the opportunity to embrace and keep those year and a half old bucks. What happens when you embrace and keep them? Well, you get to stockpile them. You know, in, in the UP of Michigan, we had on average a half a fawn per doe that would make it into the winter time. Out of those, 50% died during an average winter. These are just stats. These, these are accurate stats actually. So going into the following spring, you had one buck fawn for every four does. Hope that makes sense. Doe averages half a fawn going into the winter. Out of that, half of those die. That means there's only a quarter fawn per doe. It means there's only one buck for every four does. I hope that makes sense. There's one buck for every four does going into the springtime. So it took a lot. But... On my property, we had 14 different plots, totaling eight acres. We carved them out. They were sandy. They weren't that great of quality that you couldn't produce. It was low four, some of them pH, no nutrients. But bottom line is we built up the soil and we built up our buck, buck population. So in 99, we saw one spike and that one spike turned into 17 different bucks that we got on camera in 2006. So seven years later. Now all those we only had six or seven does, mature does, and they, again, didn't average a lot of fawns. So what I'm saying is we built our buck population by attracting, dispersing yearling bucks. Or we couldn't have seen 17 different bucks. I passed up 11 that year, shot two. So a lot of huge buck change. And, and I literally had a handful of pictures of one spike, one rub, one scrape in 99. So from 99 to 2006, just a huge explosion because we embraced and kept them. What that did is that allowed them to keep their patterns on our property. What was really cool is you'd see that pattern would be pretty wide ranging. They'd be on this plot, that plot, back and forth. And as they aged, they began to pick a side of the property. So on the other side of the creek where we had 50 acres, divided 70 acres on the other side, 50 acres, all of a sudden you see a buck over there as he aged that that was his spot. He was rarely on this side of the property. And so you kept him, and then you watched his pattern become more defined the older he became. The older he became, the, what I learned is that the easier it was to pattern. The problem was the older he became, the harder he is to hunt because he's more wary of hunting pressure. But you can learn a lot by watching spikes from the beginning and learning their traits as they age on your property even in an area where it's dominated by bait piles and public land like we did in the UP of Michigan, let alone the average hunting parcel out there that has somewhat quality habitat and higher deer numbers. So you really learn about a lot about his pattern 
But hey, bottom line, that spike comes in, it's legal, you have a tag, you don't have the opportunity at does, maybe more meat with something else, and he passes a shake test. What I mean by that, he comes in, your heart's pounding, you're shaking a little bit, you're excited, shoot him. Enjoy it. Enjoy the meat. Enjoy the hunt. I'm not going to blame you. I think that's cool. You know, I want hunters in the ranks. And if that means that you're going to go out and shoot a spike buck because that's what's available and you don't have a lot of time, more power to you. I want to count you in the hunting ranks, count you in the hunting numbers, I want you to support hunting. And that's really ultimately what's most important. Just do it with a little bit of an educated background. and Enjoy it. Embrace it. Don't say, yeah, I need to take them out of the herd. Because people who know something know that that's not a viable reason. It makes you look silly. Oh, well, you can't eat the antlers. Well, then shoot a doe. People know that too. Oh, it's the same spike. He's been that way for five years. No, he hasn't. It's still the same young year and a half old buck. He just looks the same as all the other spikes. Just embrace it. Say, hey, I just want some meat. I, illegal. He made my heart pound. Those are all incredible reasons to take them. So enjoy spike hunting or not. Enjoy the patterns that you can learn from them. Learn how you can collect dispersing yearling bucks, even when they're spikes. Keep them on your property. And I think that we can learn a lot from spikes. They, they really taught us a lot when we were younger how to hunt. Uh, they're not that hard. You know, they, they, they react to hunting pressure a lot different than they do a mature buck, a mature doe. And so the history of spikes and a lot of us when we were younger and hunting them goes back to some really cool roots. And I, and I hope you can embrace that, learn from spikes, watch them, attract them, shoot them or not, depending on your circumstances. The bottom line is enjoy hunting, even if all you see is a spike buck. Now, I appreciate you guys watching the YouTube channel, but I don't know if everyone knows everything that we have to offer, whether it's on whitetailhabitatsolutions.com our website, our WHS Wildlife Blends, our seed company. Also, Instagram you can check out. I'm very active on Instagram, putting strategies on there, photos of what we do every day. Uh, much more active there than Facebook. But our seed, web classes, books, clients, articles. I have over 600 articles on whitetailhabitatsolutions.com, everything whitetail strategy. Of course, we have hats on there. And then make sure to check us out on Instagram again. But lots of stuff to offer we're always coming out with new things and this isn't the end of it we have more things coming soon make sure to check us out